Elder Marcus, I'm going to need you to travel with me because that intro was amazing, I must say. Um, just want to give honor to this, our family. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't, but know that I consider you family. Your pastor, many of your team, your family members are family to my wife and I. Uh, we have five kiddos um, who you won't see this morning. But just know that they are here with us in spirit. Uh, your children's ministry will thank us, okay? Um, so we are continuing. We are continuing with leaving, leading uh, with this particular message around a familiar text. My hope today is that we will have new eyes for it. Um, so before we jump in, this is for me, not for you. We've prayed. Uh, but I just want to center myself in this moment as we prepare all of us to hear from God. Lord, I pray that you would speak and silence me. I look forward to what you're about to say to all of us. And I pray that the miracle that we collectively experience today is that we are made new. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And as a result, we can then finally perceive that your will is in fact good, pleasing, and perfect. We love you and trust you with that. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. 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 So we're going to a familiar text today as we continue our journey in leaving, leading as a series. And so who's familiar with Jesus's foot washing? Foot washing, right? We've seen it a lot. We've heard about it a lot. We've seen it modeled a lot. But I saw something new as I was approaching that text. And what's interesting about it is the way that we've adopted and adapted it is we've, in a sense, made it like a humble brag. Like a humble brag. Like, you've ever heard somebody humble brag? Like, uh, (laughs) I I don't want to give you too many examples because it may step on some toes, but there's almost nothing quite worse than a humble brag. Right? Like, we project this humility and this contrite spirit and humble heart and want to position ourselves with Jesus, but we're doing it to be seen. We're, we're projecting humility out of a heart of hubris. And so I don't know if that's what Jesus intended for us to do with this picture of humility. And in fact, as I took a closer look at this text, I started to realize that this was not an example of humility in isolation. This was, in fact, an act of humiliation. If we look at it in context, John 13 is sandwiched between some important events in the life of and ministry of Jesus. Just prior to this foot washing piece, Jesus is seen as predicting his death. He's foretelling them this horrific and gory thing he was going to have to endure. And it wasn't just for him in isolation. It was for all of those that would follow him. And then just following this epic picture of servant leadership, if you will, and we say that in quotes, especially in the context of this series, he then predicts that he will be betrayed by one of his very own. And so perceiving the pride in the hearts of the people around him, he did something radical and revolutionary. He washed feet. He washed feet. And so we're going to unpack that for for just a few moments today, but I just want to get us into this context. And so I would affectionately title this message, Downward Mobility. Downward mobility, how to get down and dirty like Jesus. Downward mobility. Now, if we stop there, it sounds kind of countercultural, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Like in a world of upward mobility, where the whole goal is to be promoted, where the whole goal is to get a position of power, where the whole goal is to finally arrive at that position where you get to make the decisions. Jesus' life is about downward mobility. Mobility. It's about becoming less. It's about getting low. And so we'll unpack this notion as we take our time together in this text. So I kind of want to point your attention to John 13. John 13. And we'll begin here at verse 1. And, and it reads this way. Now, before the feast of the Passover, that's important. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 2, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, 
Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Are you getting the picture here? Six, he came to Simon Peter, always have to take note when you see this hybrid name, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me, bro. Verse nine, it's there, verse nine. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head too. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. And that's only in some translations, but it's completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Oh, I'm just reading it for context. We'll get there. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place at the table, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. Messianic text 14. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, say example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, you know, something important is coming. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. What a fatherly verse. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm just reading the scripture now. Let's go, family. I am telling you this now before it takes place, prophetic, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. In parentheses, I'm about that life. 20, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, we're about to unpack this text, but I need you to understand some cultural context first. We talked about textually the context in which we read this pericope or this section of scripture, right? It's coming after he predicts his death and crucifixion and prior to him predicting his own betrayal. But now let's look at cultural context. Foot washing was not weird to them. Foot washing was not strange to them. Foot washing was a part of everyday life. And who was called to foot washing gives us a particular understanding of what Jesus was actually doing. There were really only two groups of people that washed feet. Maybe three if you go old school, old covenant. Under the old covenant, the priests would do so as a part of their preparations for doing services or rituals and rites. As they entered the holy place or they prepared certain things for the temple, a part of their cleanliness was washing their feet. So that's old school. Let's go to first century Palestine, if you will. The first one was servants. Servants washed feet. And if it wasn't the servants, the bond servants, the hired hands of a particular family, it was the wife of the owner of the home. Now, what's interesting about this context is we recognize that Passover is at hand and they are preparing for it. And so we can see in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 26, when they're like, hey, Lord, you know, the Passover is at hand. Where are we supposed to celebrate this? Like they are faithful Hebrew people. And so he says, listen, go into town and you'll see somebody who is prepared to host us. Let them know that the Lord has sent you and we're going to have Passover at their house. So what does this tell us? Jesus is not in his own home. He's not in his mother's house. They're in a stranger's house. Number one. 
Number two, this is a high and holy feast, but it's also dinner. And so we find ourselves at supper, which means they not only had their feet washed to enter somebody else's house, they had also ceremonially washed their feet because it was dinner time. So the, the way we typically hear this text taught is that Jesus got down and dirty because feet in first century Palestine were so filthy, how humbling it was for him to muddy his holy hands and to wash the disciples' feet. Their feet were clean already. Their feet were clean already. So the example of humility is not him touching their dirty feet. They were in somebody else's house, had their feet washed at the entryway of the home, and they were already seated at the table, which means they washed their feet. Now, why was foot washing for dinner such a big deal? Because they sat down low, and their feet were around the same utensils they had, not forks and knives, these utensils that they ate with. And so practically speaking, and just out of honor, they wanted their feet to be clean so that they didn't soil themselves as they ate. The disciples' feet weren't dirty, but their hands were. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world and to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John's a little weird. He's not like the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He does things kind of out of order and writes and orders things by theme, by theme. But what we understand as we hold this text parallel to the other gospels is that this is the end. This is the end of his ministry. This is the same Last Supper. This is him preparing to be arrested and betrayed and crucified. So this is almost one of his last pronounced lessons to his disciples. And so the way I've heard this most of my life is that this was a picture of humility. But as we dig into the text and see it in context, I want to present to you today that this was not just a picture of humility. This was a practice of humiliation. This was a practice of humiliation. Verse two, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, in case you're not um, familiar, Simon's son, can you imagine just for a second, like this is how you're captured in scripture. Like really, like that's my bio? Like just in case you got it wrong, it's Simon's son. Like that specific person ruined everything. That's how you're canonized. Congratulations, right? And also, when I read texts like this, I have a tendency to go, where am I like Jesus? I want to present today, challenging series, challenging message. Maybe I won't learn as much if I think I'm like Jesus. Maybe I'll learn more if I try to see myself in Judas and Peter. I might just get a little more growth than thinking I got it all together. He knew that the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray him, and he still ate with the guy. And then mid-meal, he's like, oh, I want to wash everybody's feet. How many of you would scrub his, like, extra hard or, like, dug your nails in or pinch the dude? Sorry, I just felt the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I just want to see if my healing gift works. Like, you crack a toe, put it back on, just check it. Still got it, <laughs> right? He washed the dude's feet. And so I was really wrestling with this, like, man, that's such a humble thing. It's such a kind thing. I would say that the focal point was not the 12. It was the two in this case. The two. The two that would play a pivotal role in the next events to come. Context is everything. He was about to be betrayed and arrested and crucified. What is necessary to meet God's requirement of blood over sin. So it needed to happen. So the two most critical roles were, in fact, Judas and Peter. Peter, because he's a picture of redemption. He denied Jesus three times publicly. Some scholars would say once in front of a little girl. Big bad Peter, cussing Peter, punch you first, Peter, cut your ear off, Peter. Gangster Peter, tough guy, Peter. Did the tough mutter three years in a row, Peter. Denied Jesus publicly in front of a child. But he's a picture of redemption. Because after he goes off in hiding and feels like he's not fit for ministry, Jesus goes, now you're ready. Now you're humble enough to lead. Feed my lambs, lead my sheep. Why are you back fishing again? I've called you to fish for humans. And then we have Judas. 
And the crucifixion would not have went down unless he got betrayed. And some of y'all are looking for your ministry ascension. Betrayal's a part of it. Betrayal is a part of it. And rather than resisting those that betray you, see it as a setup. It's not a setup to do you in. It's a setup to get your heart right for what you're called to do. You can't take that pride with you. You can't take that hubris with you. Life's too smooth for you right now. You don't know how to trust God in anything. You feel like it's an assumption in your life. You need to go through hard stuff to see what God does with hard stuff. So don't shun your Judas. Wash his feet. Come on now, preach it. Preach it. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. That's the setup. How can he do this? When we see trouble coming, when we see betrayal coming, we resist it. He got low. How could he get low? Because he knew that what was more certain than his betrayal was his own redemption. Some of you are struggling with that right now. It looks like what they're doing is working. It looks like that coworker has gotten to the people in those positions and ruined your reputation. It looks like the person in your family has convinced those even around you in your closest intimate circle that you're not who you say you are. It looks like it's working, but what is more certain than the betrayal was the father's promise. So the reason Jesus was able to get low is he truly trusted what his father had said. I love scripture, that's why it's here. Knowing that the father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he didn't count this life as too much. He didn't count the call of God as too much. He didn't count serving as too much. Who cares if you're humiliated down here if you're going to live up there forever? What a flicker of a moment this life is. So if I can get low down here to be with him there, it's worth it. But I need you to see this, though. Jesus needed the same confirmation. He needed the same encouragement. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane because he had questions, too. And some of the pride that stops us from growing and getting understanding and revelation is we won't ask our questions because we're projecting like we know already. Let's see what Jesus knew. Jesus, knowing he was going to be betrayed, still followed through. Jesus, knowing he was going to be denied by his right hand man, still followed through. Because he trusted that the promise of God was more certain than the betrayal of his friends. So he does something weird. He rises up. From supper, he takes off his clothes. Pause here for a minute. This is strange behavior. (laughs) You're at a little dinner sit down with Jesus. Wanted to say dinner date, that makes it even more awkward. You're hanging out with your friend Jesus. Dude, mid bread getting passed around, goes, hold on. He's Jesus. He does stuff like that. He flipped it up. He's nice. And then gets a basin full of water. And everybody's like, yo, whoa, Jesus, what is going on? They're freaked out. Why? Because this was not culturally normative. You wash feet when you enter the house. They were already in. You wash feet before you eat. They were already sitting down at the table. Only servants wash feet or the wife of the owner of the house, whom none of us know, honestly. Why are you disrobing and getting a basin of water? It wasn't to give them a picture of humility. It was knowing the pride in their hearts to humiliate them. Get low. I'm not the only one getting low. Get low with me. It was just as uncanny for Jesus to disrobe and wash their feet as it was for them to let him. If this was my church, I'd knock some stuff over. But it's not. Self-control is a beautiful place. Think about that. It was just as radical for them to let him wash their feet, which is why Peter freaked out. 
And so he came to Simon Peter, verse 6, who said to him, Lord, do you wash, whoa, do you wash my feet? Like, wait a minute. Like, I can see his toes curling up and him, like, trying to <laughs> dodge this moment. Like, Jesus is there. It's Jesus. You can't really go away. Like, he'll go through walls and stuff like that. He'll do that in Acts and everything. It's weird. What is happening, right? You can't get away from Jesus. So he's like, uh, like, do you really wash my feet? And here's, here's, how he, here's how he responds. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Pause. <laughs> Washing feet is normative in their culture. So why would he say what I'm doing now, you don't understand? They've had their feet washed hundreds of times in their lifetime. Hundreds of times in their lifetime. Why would he say, you don't understand what I'm doing? Because he was completely turning power structures and cultural norms on their head. He is their rabbi, was behaving like a servant in a stranger's house. I can imagine the servants of that house and the wife of the husband of the house were even cringing if they could perceive what was going on. This is out of order. It is shameful to me to allow you to take this position in my home. That's what I ought to be doing. Because he wasn't washing their feet to get the dirt off. He was washing their feet to get the dirt out. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet, first of all. Okay, you're telling God no. <laughs> I told you, we're not Jesus in this. How many, ooh, how many times you told God no? <laughs> we're like, Peter, this guy. Denied him three times. I'd have been down, Jesus. How many times you denied him? And it's not you, it's us. I'm with you. Remember my prayer? How many times have we denied him? How many times have we told God no out of a projection of humility, but the root in our heart is hubris, pride. Don't wash my feet. Who are you talking to? This is your rabbi. This is your teacher. You don't get to disagree with him. This is first century Palestine. Who do you think you are disagreeing with God? If God wants to wash your feet, you let him. What it shows is that in your heart is resistance and rebellion, which can't go through with this ritual. Which is why Jesus was doing it. Their feet weren't dirty, their hands were. Woo! Then he says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. That's not even Jesus' heart. That's him speaking our language because we only do stuff for conditional reasons. He commands us to get low. He says, if you want to be first, be last. But here's how we read that. I want to be first, so I better be last so that I can be first. Y'all, y'all, y'all. I'm going to stay away. I'm going to knock something over. Ooh. That's what we do. We turn commands into conditional statements. If I do this, then I get that. So the only reason I do it is not because it pleases God's heart, not because it's right, not because Jesus told me to, but because there's something in it for me. We're consumers. So we speak in his language. He's like, bro, you have no share with me. You see how he responds? Whoa! Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I won't share with you because I know you're going to reign and rule and all this other stuff. Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. How, how, how prophetic is that? The same mind that would be overcome with fear and doubt. I'm Peter for a second. I'm the only one that has the revelation of who he is. I'm the only one that realized you are the Messiah. I'm the only one that has discernment as to his calling and the weight of glory that he carries with him in human form. But I'm the one that denied him publicly. I didn't want Jesus for who he was. I wanted Jesus for what he could do for me in his role. Some of us serve for the wrong reasons. 
want to get close to the person so that the person can do something for you. Not because it's right, not because it's godly, not because it's humble. Because we make commands into conditional statements that benefit us. And so he says, Lord, not my feet, but my hands and my head also. The same hands that would have blood on them. Metaphorically speaking, the same head that would perceive that you are the Christ, but then deny you out of fear and doubt in your moment of need. Interesting words here, Peter. 10, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash. So prophetic here. He's basically saying, are you like admitting you're dirty? We saw it in verses earlier. He already knew what was about to happen. He knew Judas was going to betray him. He also knew Peter was going to deny him. Peter didn't. Say, God, help me. The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Say, if you, your body's washed, we walk through these dirty streets with sandals on, a clean person only has to wash their feet. And you are clean. Woo-hoo-hoo. He's like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Because he was nervous for a second. Remember, this is a sidebar conversation between Peter and Jesus. And so Jesus is like, listen, bro, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but clean people don't need to bathe. They're clean already. And he's like, and you're clean too. He's like, oh, thank you. He's like, but not every one of you. And they're like, oh. (laughs) Start looking around the room. Awkward. (laughs) Right? For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean, right? So let me go to 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place at the table, everyone sighed. Like, that's not in there. It's like, woohoo, that was weird. You know what I'm saying? Jesus disrobed and washed their feet in the position of a servant or position of the woman of the house. And he's a dude and he's a rabbi and he's God. That's awkward. They breathed a sigh of relief when this was over. Because it wasn't supposed to be a picture of humility. It was a practice of humiliation for everybody in the house. Ooh, sorry. It's not mine. And resume this place at the table. Do you understand what I have done to you? To you. Not for you. To you. This practice has shifted something in your heart. For most of you because you still have free will. You still have the option to betray me. And Judas, I don't even blame you because Satan entered your heart and made you do it. Some of you are blaming people right now like they're the devil. Come on, with that word right there. Satan influenced them for God's glory and you're good. Don't complain. It had to go down. You call me teacher and Lord. Notice the order there. And you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, that's the right order, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So what does that mean? When he's talking about like get low, it's also not only the position of a servant, it's the position of a student. You will learn from one another as you serve one another. Because guess what? I'm about to get out of here. And it's better that I go because right now Holy Spirit is contained in me and I can delegate him to you. But when I leave, the comforter is going to come in full and rest on every believer and you will actually be empowered to do what I've commissioned you to do. So in Acts, the church is actually born and the church is framed in Matthew 28, but they weren't empowered to accomplish it until Holy Spirit came. And so he's saying, listen, I, I need you to understand what this means For I have given you an example. You will learn from one another as you serve one another because you will be gifted uniquely and be tasked with spurring on one another into maturity and godliness in my absence. Now, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Why is he saying that? Because they thought they were. You're no better than me. Oh, God. 
we read the New Testament with foreknowledge of what happened. They didn't have it. We read the resurrection into the crucifixion. We read glorification into the crucifixion. We read the end of all things into the crucifixion. They thought it was over with. And they also thought it was just for him. So yeah, take up your cross and follow me, sure, so I can watch you get crucified. No, this cross is for you too. And that's what's kind of hard for us, like in modern Western churchianity, is we have the privilege of safety when it comes to our sanctification. The reason they could say back then that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth wasn't because it was a warm, fuzzy, emotional moment. They would be put to death. To say Jesus is God, to say that Yeshua is Yahweh, not only upset the religious apple cart, but also the Romans apple cart. It was a problem. So if you could say that, it had to be by the power of Holy Spirit. Nowadays, everybody says they're Christian. But who's following him? I believe you're following him. I believe we are following him. We just have to follow him in the right things. There's prophetic and there's pastoral. Here's the shepherd's heart. If you think it's a picture of humility, you'll miss it. Our hearts are so filled with pride, we need humiliation. And to the degree that we're blind to our own hubris, we will resent God for helping us. Make He exalts the humble and opposes the proud. Thank you for humiliating me. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, God bless. I'm going to take you down to these takeaways because the time is at hand. I want to point you to Philippians 2 real quick. Philippians 2. And so we have this encouragement here in verse 5 through 11, and it reads this way. Have this mind in or among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here's the good news. Christianity is not you trying to mimic Jesus. It's Jesus being himself in and through you. The reason Christianity or churchianity, as I call it, is so difficult is because it's powerless people trying to be a powerful God. We'll fail every time, be miserable, be stressed out, feel like losers, feel guilty. I'm striving to be just like Jesus. You don't need to strive. You need to submit. Guess who's good at being holy? Holy Spirit. So let Holy Spirit be yourself. Now it makes sense when Paul says it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ within me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus died, was resurrected, and he's in glory. Guess who's left here to carry on his work? You need the power of God to do it. So let this mind be in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's not something you have to go get. It's not something you have to save up for. It's not something you have to graduate into. It's yours in Christ. Open it up and use it. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And something that, that's counterintuitive to the messianic stature of Jesus. No, he's saying when I'm in human form, my flesh can feel stuff. So when I can be tempted, I didn't sin, but I can be tempted. How do we know this? Because in Matthew, as soon as he's baptized, he's led into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by the devil. He knew in a human suit he could be tempted. Now, thankfully, he never disobeyed. But that's why this text can say he never saw equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He knew what his call was. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. For us, we have a hard time grasping the concept of God. So we're better at stuff that we can touch and interface with. It's the Apple store. God did the Apple store. (laughs) Millennia ago. Oh, I can see the commercial, but can I touch this? Can I interface with it? Can I try it out? That's Jesus. He came in human form. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself. We don't have to be humiliated if we humble ourselves. But if we don't, God will help us. 
Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And that's not symbolic, that's literal. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Let's pause there because that's why we do this if we're honest. We don't do this to exalt the name that's already been given to Jesus. We do this to get a name ourselves. So yes, I'll follow Jesus so I can go to heaven. Yes, I'll follow Jesus so I can be numbered with the saints. Yes, I'll follow Jesus so I can have influence. Yes, I'll follow Jesus so I can be the good person. Right. Everything's about him. Yeah. That heaven we're hoping to go to is going to come down here. Eden's going to be reestablished. It's called the new Jerusalem. There will be no separation between God and his creation because sin will be done away with. And it's all going to be about him for all of time. Glory to the lamb, not glory to us. And here it is in verse 10. I didn't make it up. So that at the name of Jesus or Yeshua or whatever you say in any different language, because some people get weird about that, there's power in the name. We didn't even know what the vowels were in ancient Hebrew, so it's all kind of a guess anyway. But I sure know that when I say it, stuff happens. Jesus, Isa, Jesus, Yeshua. It's the power in the spirit of his name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Don't forget the burning people. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeshua is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. So let me give you a little points and we'll get out of here. Here's the first one. If you won't get down to their feet, you'll never get up to your cross. Jesus says, if you don't deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you have no parts with me. Same language he said to Peter when he says, you have no share with me if I can't wash your feet. It's humiliating, y'all. I got to pick up my cross and it's for me, not like, look, Jesus, I did it. Can I put it down now? No, it's for you. When they hate you, when they ridicule you, when they persecute you, it's on my account. If you don't get down to their feet, you'll never get up to your cross. Here's the next one. Our culture thinks leading is about position, power, and prestige. But in the kingdom, following is about servanthood, sacrifice, and selflessness. Don't let the culture contour you to its values. The kingdom is literally about becoming less, not to become more, but because you realize how grand God is and you can't compete. What good is me standing up like this when God is the one who needs and deserves the attention? Stay low. Which brings me to my last point. Don't get low to get high. Get low to stay low. Yeah. Don't turn commands into conditional statements. He said, do this to one another. Not so that you can get something, not so that you can get a reward. Do this because it's right. Because if I've done it, who are you to say you won't? This is about downward mobility. And we can, and I believe we will, get down and dirty just like Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Oh, thank you for your example. And please forgive us for reforming it, for editing it, for making it something that's about us. I long for the day where foot washing ceremonies are done in private as they were in houses. Done in the privacy of homes as, a, as an offering of hospitality and not a projection of holiness. It was humiliating, God. But what's crazy is you didn't just get low to wash their feet. You got low out of your seat in glory and came down into the depths of the earth to walk amongst your creation. And all of us, just like Peter, questioned why you were doing what you were doing. If you're really the son of God, do what we want. If you're really the son of God, be a leader. If you're really the son of God, overthrow the Romans. But no, he came to die that we might live. But it didn't stop there. He not only came into the depths of the earth, but when he died, he didn't go to heaven. 
he faced the enemy and overcame literally sin, death, and the grave and took the keys back so that he no longer had a say over Sheol. Then he revealed himself to us so that we might know truly that there is no greater name. So I want to encourage you. Whatever you've been fed, not here, you're in a good house. I mean out there. That told you it's about upward mobility. I want to encourage you to take after the model of Jesus, the example of Jesus. Get low because he got low for you. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if there's anyone in this space who recognizes now what the good news is all about, it's not about you trying to be like Jesus. It's Jesus being himself in and through you. He got low into our mess, into our filth, facing our pride and took it on himself. And in exchange for our punishment, he yet and still gives us a prize. I want to encourage you, it's not to go to heaven. It's to be a part of bringing heaven to earth. For that is his prayer that he modeled for us. And so if that's you, just in the last few moments that we have, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you want to step out of religion and into relationship, if you want to step out of tradition and into truth, and you recognize who Jesus truly is in this moment, this is the power of God to save your soul. Is there anyone? I'd be honored to pray with you. So your prayer may sound something like this. Lord, thank you for getting low for me. I've missed your mark. I've been filled with pride. But I thank you for humbling me with a picture of servanthood and for rescuing me from what I deserved. And I thank you for forgiving me for the moments that I question you, for the moments that I deny you, for the moments that I betray you. But you were faithful and loved me to the end. So I place my faith and trust in you, recognizing that you are Lord and that your life, death, and resurrection is enough for me. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to empower me to fulfill all that you have called me to be. I submit to you now, no longer striving, and declare that I am saved. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 If you would, uh, just stand to your feet. Let's give it up for the Lord and what he's doing in this house, what he's doing in this series, what he's doing in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. And I just want to encourage you with these final words. Don't get low to get high. Get low to stay low. Because Jesus' kingdom is about downward mobility. We love you so much. We now commission you out into the world to be salt and light and to make a difference right where you live. Because God loves you and he's the light inside of you. God bless you. Have an incredible week. Yeah.